morning and welcome everyone. Thank you to our panelists for being here and thank you to the audience for being here. Uh, uh, the theme today is, is the medium now the story, which is of course makes you think of the changing medium today and everybody thinks of digital. But just to go back to when storytelling first began, which is as old as humanity. I mean, what makes us human is that we tell stories, one of the things that makes us human. And the first stories were told, if one thinks about it, around campfires. People sitting in a circle, listening to one person tell a story. That campfire in the modern times is that what became the television, sort of a modern campfire. People sitting around the television and getting their story in this form. And I see the campfire as having further deconstructed into a millions of flames. Think of your little iPhones and your little smartphones. And the campfire is now in your hand, and everybody gets their story individually. But it's the same story, but it's changed down millennia. So I'm going to ask our historians Mr. Sunil Kilnani, to talk a little bit about this whole arc of storytelling. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, I guess, as, as Nina suggested, I mean, the, the very earliest stories, it seems to me, emanate from our sense of physical space, of the land, of landscape, of forests, <clears throat> lakes, streams, oceans. They're stories that speak from the stones, the trees, the water around us, um, the stories that have literally a that animate us and, and, and the early versions of animism. Humans tell stories about the places they move across. And so if you think of, for example, um, the Aborigines with the song lines, which Bruce Chatwin wrote about, um, though, where, where even walking through a space, walking through a landscape itself is a way of telling a story. It seems to me that's really where storytelling perhaps began. Um, but when we think of stories today, we of course think of the great myths. We think of the oral tales of the Greeks or uh, the Mahabharat. Um, we think of the Iliad and the Odyssey ascribed to a figure we call Homer. Uh, we think of, uh, as I say, the Mahabharat told by Vyas. Of course, figures like Homer and Vyas were probably not individuals. They may have been collective tellers uh, a name that we ascribe to a whole series of people who told these stories. They may even have been a family of storytellers whom we gave that name. And we're talking about the somewhere between the 8th and the 6th century um, before the Christian era. And one of the things I think that those oral stories underline is the importance of voice. The, the, no, the importance of a, a voice which underlines, or which is fundamental to storytelling. But quite early on also, I think we get visual forms of storytelling. So uh, the tales of the Buddha, for instance, uh, told in the Jataka forms, in the, in, 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 in the friezes that we see from the third or second century uh, BC onwards. So both voice and visual forms of storytelling, I think, are, are very early on in the imagination uh, of how we, uh, how we engage with stories. Then, just moving very fast forward, um, we get stories which become chronicles and histories, kind of legitimations of power, of dynasties, of beliefs and deeds. And, of course, one of the greatest uh, exploiters of those kind of stories was Shakespeare, uh, who understood that human drama uh, is, is, it can be extracted from these chronicles, these what often look like dull chronicles of event after event. Shakespeare was able to turn them into performances. Uh, he opened up the stage as a way of telling stories. And all of these stories, as, as Nina uh, underlined in her opening remarks, these were collective forms of storytelling where communities would come together and tell and listen. Um, and that collective form, I think, gets disturbed in around the late 18th or 19th centuries, where stories suddenly could now be read in private by those who were literate, the emergence of the novel. Uh, and this was seen as a great disturbance to the social order, particularly for men, because suddenly women 
could read stories in private. Men could no longer control the stories that women had access to. So the novel was seen as corrupting somehow, that it was undermining the hierarchical order of male power. So I think that's a very, mom a very important moment in the history of storytelling. Uh, and that point about whether we experience stories as collectively or in private, I think is an important point that we might want to discuss. And of course, then over the last 200 years, there have been so many other forms of storytelling, opera, uh, the huge transformation produced by film and television, comic books, radio, museums, which have become a way of telling stories, a way in which nations tell their own stories by arranging objects in a particular way, uh, the myths they tell themselves. And then more recently, graphic novels, video games, which are in themselves a world of stories and fantasy. But one thing, um, I, 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 one of the great inventions of storytelling that I just want to underline uh, as a starting point is that stories also, I think, very importantly, they don't just entertain and engage us, they teach us something, and they teach us irony, I think. They teach us that uh, our actions, the hero's actions, always escape their intentions. What we do never quite fulfills what we want to do, and that's a basic fact of every human action. So whether it's Sophocles telling about Oedipus, or Chaucer's wife of Bath, or Tristram Shandy, Lawrence Stern's great novel, these are all novels where the hero doesn't quite fulfill what they set out to do. The, the limits of human ambition so while storytelling is very often about limitless ambition and the inventiveness of the human spirit, it's also a reminder, I think, of the limits of our actions, the unintendedness and the finitude of human action. Irony, as opposed to the narcissism uh, of, of storytelling, which is, I think, also a fundamental aspect of it. And I think that notion of irony is something that's very important that we remember, particularly today, when storytelling and myth-making has become such an integral part of our political world and imagination. Thank you, Sunil. And irony is something, Kathy, that is sort of stock and trade of cartoonists. It's, it's what you all deal in. How has the digital transformation impacted that? Um, well, I'd like to have, um, I was to have control of the images, yeah. but I would like to have a first image up of my work. And is that possible? Yes, I think it might be up Is on it over screen. there? Okay. So that, no. whether it's... Um... Yeah, it's yep. up there. Okay, no. So the, the who it's about is not particularly important for, for, um, for my purposes here. Um, but it's the, um, the way that the digital uh, and the 24-hour news cycle has changed the way news is in the way that, um, that reporters report it and in the way a cartoonist works with it. So what we have instead of a story that is a sort of encapsulated moment in time which is written about and drawn about and appears in the newspaper the next day, Instead, we've got, by the time that I'm looking at, at social media first thing in the morning, uh, I'm already hearing about something without knowing what that thing is. I'm hearing the people's reaction to it. And so I've got in this, in this cartoon, there's the, the um, call for the politician to answer questions, and the politician answers the questions, and then what we think of what she said, and then what you think of what she said, and then what you think of what we think, and then what that says about you, and what that says about her, and then what the opposition politician says about anything. Um, so it's it's the matter of, of that instead of um, instead of a moment in time, um, news stories are now a, a moving arc, a meteor through <laughs> through space, that, and and you have to sort of catch it on its on its projection, and also imagine where it's going to land by the time that your work. Appears in the in the um, in the either online or uh, or in the newspaper the next day. But you have a huge audience now. Do you enjoy that social media feedback, or uh, or is it like tiresome, or do you enjoy it? No, look, um, I I entered social media with um with some caution and um, some trepidation, and I was reassured by by my teenage children that that it was okay to to venture venture there, um, and what. 
what it made for me was the difference between, say, if I were an actor standing on a stage full of, of a hall full of people and I did my, my show and nobody responded and then two weeks later maybe somebody would come and tap, tap me on the shoulder in the street and say, oh, by the way, I really like that show. You know, um, yeah. the, the difference with Twitter is the audience is able to respond immediately and I'm getting the, the, the sense of whether, whether I've hit the mark, whether I've understood a situation in a way that resonates with a lot of people and so on. And so, so it's, very, it, it's been very, very much an affirming thing to have, have that instant um, response, uh, albeit, you know, gratifyingly, you know, gratifying to the, uh, to the ego. So digital has been good for you? Digital yes. has, has definitely been good for me and brought and made more of a conversation about what I do rather than it being something that I that I put out into the into the um, into the darkness and not hear anything back. Thank you, Anand. Uh, the whole your lovely film Ship of Theseus. The whole thought experiment there was: if a ship, if the same ship is made from new wood every part of the ship is replaced, the hull, the mast, the rigging, the sails. Is it the same ship? So let's look, let's use that analogy for storytelling. If it's the same story, the same flesh and bone, but the same story, but it has different media, different wood to make it, is it the same story? How does it change? Yeah. Um well, to some extent, we have been telling the same story over and over again for thousands of years. For um, If we look at the, the, the stories that, that we are telling now, yeah. I'm, uh, I, I often do this exercise where, where I look at a popular fil film, a film that is doing really well in mainstream India, Indian cinema. Um, Give an example. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of stuff I subject myself to very seldom, uh, just for academic uh, purposes, but for example, uh, when I absolutely uh, get academically curious, I, I do subject myself to something like Bahubali. And, um, and then I break it down to what, we, what is really going on. So if you look at the, uh, from everything from the, uh, from the regressive misogyny in the film to, uh, to, the, to the celebration of revenge, to the celebration of, uh, of um, genetic hierarchy uh, and uh, all these ideas, if you can replace, if you look at the whole film, you can replace it scene by scene with a, nation, with a National Geographic documentary about apes, and it will fit. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I've done this. Really, you should go back and, uh, you know, turn on one of these films, go through the whole film scene by scene, and wonder if this can happen with primates, if this particular moment can be, can be happening with primates, and mostly you'll find that the answer is yes. And that is telling about, uh, about the kind of stories we, we, have been, we have been sharing with each other for thousands of years now. Um, biologically, we're not changing that often. Mm -hmm. Anatomically, we're not changing that often. In fact, uh, we are more or less the same species that we have been for the last 200, 250,000 years with very few, very few mutations, very few changes. So what is changing really is our algorithms. What is changing really is our augmentation of our realities. Our algorithms are changing. Uh, I'll explain, yeah. I'll kind of, I'm, so I end up using codified language and uh, uh, so what is, what is changing really is the way we, we augment our lives around us. Um, the way we build uh, an entire world of, uh, of safety, the way we build a world of order, the way we build a world of, um, of policy, of social contracts. Um, and we educate ourselves in these social contracts from a very early age so that uh, we, we can transcend our nature, which is replete with murder and coercion, as much as it is replete with empathy and compassion. And uh, through these stories, through algorithms, and stories for me are algorithms. Uh -huh. Stories for me are ways, are tools of processing data. Stories for me are tools uh, of processing a wide variety of information that you're constantly subjected to. And when we pass on stories from, from one to other, whether vertically or horizontally, whether across the same generation or, or through various generations, what we are essentially passing on are perspectives, insights, worldviews, uh, ways of 
whether the story is coming through irony or whether through through non-fiction or whether it's coming through through cinema or virtual reality, what we are essentially constantly trying to pass on are insights, ideas, tools, uh, ways of looking at things, worldviews, um, experiences, mm -hmm. feelings. Uh, but all put together, essentially, we are we are passing on processes. We are passing on approaches to look at the wide variety of experiences, the wide variety of relationships that individually we experience with our universe and and approaching these relationships with an increasing, hopefully with an increasing amount of clarity, with an increasing amount of enlightenment, with an increasing amount of collectively, the aspiration is there with an increasing amount of uh, uh, certainty of, of life. So again, to explain that further, what I would say is that if you look at the aspiration of a cave painting, the, the fundamental aspiration of a cave painting is not very different from the fundamental aspiration of, uh, aspiration of a virtual reality experience. Yes, explain so. virtual reality a little, Anand. Okay, so... Uh, what is it exactly? Why is it so special? How is it even better than film? It's not, be it's not better or worse than film. It's, uh, it's, it's another tool that we have invented which will allow us to replicate reality with a greater degree of fidelity. Okay. So uh, the way you can never argue that film is better than literature or, or video never killed the radio star really. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think virtual reality is a replacement of cinema. It's, uh, it's, it's a new tool that we have invented that can help us capture our universe, our reality with a greater degree of fidelity. So I'll just to, for audiences here, how many of you have had a VR experience already? Okay, see about 20, 25, 30 percent of the audience seems to have had yeah. a VR experience. For those of you who haven't had an experience, we have set up a booth. It's called Memesis Elsewhere from our studio. Uh, thanks to Times Lit Fest for inviting us for that. And uh, so you can all go and have that experience this time uh, of what a VR experience essentially is. It's a replication. It's a time space bubble of reality. So to give you an example, if this was recorded in a VR experience, uh, you'd be able to see this as if you're actually here. You'd be actually present in this space. So you can actually turn your he head around. If, uh, if the camera is placed somewhere center in the center of the room, if you look straight, you'd look at me. If you look behind, you look at the whole audience. You can look at the roof, look at the floor. You can practically turn your head around and look at the whole space around you as if you are physically present in that space. So it's uh, it's a it's a greatest in our item it's in uh, in our toolkit of sort toolkits of uh, of record keeping of archiving of uh, of transmitting insights and information and transmitting feelings and experiences if you look at the project the human project of of uh, of transmitting experiences transmitting insights transmitting tools and transmitting uh, sciences it starts in cave painting it starts in probably before cave painting in 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 just basic bit systems of, of transmitting sounds and transmitting information that is pre-coded with sounds or transmitting information that is pre-coded with very simple rituals of putting flames on and putting flames off um, and could go up to cave painting and go, can go from cave painting to the detail of a Renaissance painting and from Renaissance to photography, which has a greater fidelity than a painting of capturing reality and from photography to cinematography, from cinematography to virtual reality. So there is an increasing degree of fidelity with which we are capturing reality. But that doesn't change the, the stories we are telling as much. What we are essentially constantly trying to do is build upon the stories. We are accumulating the stories over a period of time. Each passing generation, we are accumulating new stories. We are accumulating new insights, new ways of living life with a, a, a more or less collective common aspiration of making life, making life more sustainable, making human life at that more sustainable to begin with, and then in, by extension, making life more sustainable. Okay. And uh, to take up from your cave paintings, which is one thing thinks of as sort of the oldest form of storytelling, poetry is not that old, but it's pretty old, Robert. Robert is, wears many hats. He's an actor, he's a producer, theater, in theater. Uh, what else? But he's a poet, which is what I'm, I'm interested a, in. I'm here principally as a poet. Yes, that's what I like. Yeah, you're as a poet. How's poetry doing today with all the new media? Is it surviving? Well, and also, you must read one of your poems, please, if you have one. I, I think every decade there is a constant iteration that this is the decade of poetry. This is the poetry <laughs> revelation. At last, at last, poetry has come back. And. Uh, you know, as a poetry, I think I'm a poetry activist, really. I want to believe in poetry. I'm a passionate advocate for poetry. 
But I absolutely agree with you. I think at the core of it, it's the same thing. Poetry is about essence. It's about going right to the core. It's about the essential, the essential truth and the expression of that. And I don't think that has changed through the millennia. At all. That is at core what it does. But I do think the new landscape, and really it's the same, absolutely the same as you're saying. It's about the intensification. It's about the dispersal. There are new opportunities, definitely, in the new media landscape. But it's all about making the poem more immediate. So that's Kathy's point, really. Now we have a dialogue. Poetry is out there much, much more than before. There's a transmission away from poetry on the page, which was a small and smaller and smaller and more and more elite market, mm -hmm. to poetry being a conversation, an expression, a political platform, a cry for help. All that is possible now because we have a different media landscape. So uh, there must be the purists who are sort of pushing back and saying poetry should remain poetry on the page with lots of white space. I can be are a, you a purist? I can be a purist too, and I'm not a purist, because okay. I absolutely understand that in, in a world where the word is completely falsified, where truth is no longer believable, actually, you want to go to somewhere and feel I'm, a, I'm in a safe place where people will tell me the truth. And poetry does have that sort of arena, that sort of premise. <clears throat> but at your peril, do you apportion poetry into a segregated, sacred space where nobody goes and nobody visits and nobody reads? And sometimes I do think, why do I write poetry? Because no one's out there. But <laughs> on the other hand, my other hat, I want poetry to be accessible, meaningful, I want it to have reach. And I think we're all speaking poetry. When we go to a football match, we're chanting in rhyme. When we write a love letter, we lapse immediately into the language of intensity and rhythm. Um, <coughs> and when you sing a song to a baby, you are, you are, that's poetry. So poetry is everywhere, it's in all our lives. So often I will eschew the label, no, it's not poetry. Come in, welcome in, it's, it's everything, it's everybody's. And sometimes I will say, yes, there are special things that poetry does, and I passionately believe that. Poetry has a, a uniqueness and a specialness, but it's for everybody. You said at one point you were known as the poet who made up poems on the spot. Yes. And all the kinds of requests you got. You want the story? Yes, I want the story. Well, um, we were popularizing poetry in the UK, and as part of the BBC, I was also doing that. So to get poetry out there using the radio, the television, popular media, and the, the Poetry Society, which runs the poetry within the UK, were approached by Dolmio Pasta, the pasta-making company. The equation being poetry, Italy, passion, love, poetry. <laughs> what we need, absolutely, what we need for Valentine's Day, we need a poet. So they went to the Poetry Society, they knocked on the door, and they said, please, give us a poet for National Poetry Day for Valentine's Day. No, came the answer. We're not going to soil our hands or our <laughs> words with anything as despicable as popularism. And so finally, the, the telephone calls probably began with the National Poet Laureate, and they probably ended up at me several, several weeks later. <laughs> So I'm not proud. So basically, I said, yes, absolutely. I can see how you can turn this into an opportunity. So I wrote 10 tips for writing a Valentine's Day poem. My premise being that anybody can write a poem as long as it's authentic and as long as you have something to say to somebody and it's something that matters. And I, I gave them very clear, simple models. So a list poem. Everyone makes shopping lists. Everyone makes a list. Every day of our lives, we make a list. Write 10 things about the person you love. That's a poem, and so on. So basically, I, gave, I took away the fear. I took away the, the horrible atmospheric, the horrible um, trepidation about poetry and made it something we all do. And then I had my downfall. So they discovered me. They said, he can make up poems on the spot. So they put me on the radio, one radio program after another, after another, and then they put, threatened to put me on breakfast television. Um, <laughs> but I had to, I basically had to do it, but I'm not going to make up poems today, Nina. Not whatever you do, whatever <laughs> the Times Lit Fest pays me, no. <laughs> but I do have brought a poem with me, so later. Thank you very much. Well, taking up from the point about poetry and authenticity, 
We live in the time, as everybody knows, of fake news. And there's so much out there, and it's really hard to tell. And to get back to the, uh, how the medium is the story, Sunil, you're a historian. You've worked with print all your life. But you thought it was very important to take history to a wider audience, and you chose a different medium for your wonderful series, Incarnations, the story of India through 50 lives. Can you tell us what prompted you to do this? A little bit about Incarnations. Sure. Um, importantly, it was not the story of India and 50 lives, but the history of India and 50 lives. And, and, but that's an important distinction, because um, I, I think that you know, while, while I agree that in some sense, many of the stories we tell do follow a basic similar pattern, a basic similar plot, a hero in search of something uh, who has obstacles on, on their way and then finally achieves it. At the same time, history is about different stories. It's not always about the same story. It's about distinctive stories and it's about individuality and it's about very particular facts. Um, so, you know, what, what I, what, that, that's what interests me, um, how the stories are different, how uh, a 10th century philosopher or a poet is different from a 19th century one and what are the different choices and conditions and so on that they live in. So, um, that's you know a, a fundamental fact, but as you say, how can one of the things I've been long interested in is how can you take those facts and make them interesting for a wider audience? Uh, writing is is one powerful way which we've done for centuries, and and, and that does work to some extent. But now um, we do have these new tools, as as as, as you and Anand have mentioned, that can augment the kinds of ways in which we, we, we tell our stories. And so I, I was very drawn to radio, to voice again, uh, as a way of telling stories, more than actually I was drawn to film. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I mean, I think that, 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 that there's a way in which film is extremely powerful, but it's almost too powerful. It overwhelms the meaning sometimes. So if you're working with a filmmaker or a, a cinematographer, it's the image that dominates uh, a particular moment or a scene. And then you have to work around that image because you fall in love with an image uh, and then that sort of dominates that episode. Whereas with words, you have a bit more freedom. You can evoke a scene. You can try and uh, 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 use the imagination of the listener to enter into a scene. It, it seems to me, uh, if you're telling a complex historical story, words actually give you more freedom than the image. Um, so I, I, I was drawn to radio, uh, but also to podcasts. And of course, those are two very different ways of listening. Radio is, we, we, when we listen to radio, it's in a room, in a more collective form. Podcasts are a very individual way of listening. We listen just with our own earphones or earbuds. And so I, I, I was interested in, 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 in trying to both speak to a listener as an individual, but also um, as part of a, a collective group where they might argue with one another. And, and, and one of the things that, that, that uh, I, I found is that radio and podcasts, they force you to compress, to, to, to edit uh, what are the facts you're going to use, what are the details you're going to use. Uh, Virginia Woolf has a, a very fine phrase about the fertile fact, the fact that can grow in your mind and tell you about, about the person. So, you know, just to give you an instance, um, I, I write uh, in my book and I have a, a podcast about an uh, 18th century painter, uh, from a Pahari painter called Nansuk. Now, Nansuk, we don't know very much about his life, uh, but he was a, he, he in a sense took forward the conventions of Pahari miniature painting. And one of the things that I noticed when I looked at his work was that he, how, how individual, how he individuated the figures he, he drew. And I was very struck, for example, he paints a very conventional uh, scene that you see in hundreds of miniatures of a, a, a courtly scene uh, with the, 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 the king and his musicians, listening to his musicians and, and court musicians. But when you look very closely at what he draws, I, I looked at one of the faces of the musicians, and he had actually put the pock marks of smallpox on this painter's face. And suddenly this conventional figure came alive to me. There was an individual life in that figure's face. And I was very struck by how Nansu could, could bring that and suddenly opened up a story there. I became interested in this 
courtly musician? What was his story? How did, did Nansuk know him? Did he know the other musicians? How, what was his life? And so I, I think in that way, and, and that's something you know, I, I talked about in, 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 in my podcast. And I think that way, j just to notice particular facts which make a story or a historical epoch come alive. And I can, there are many other examples. But one, one final thing I would just uh, end, uh, say is that I think the form in which we tell stories does matter. And we can tell absolutely true stories or true histories sometimes in fictional forms, and they can be very effective. I th think, for instance, of um, uh, a journalist, David Simon, who wrote the script for The Wire. Now, David Simon was, was a factual journalist working for a newspaper right, uh, reporting on, on the city of, of Baltimore and, drug and drugs and crime and so on. But he decided to tell that story through fiction, through a TV series, which became The Wire, which of course had a huge impact and drew people into the story of, of, of you know, downbeat Baltimore in a way in which a series of journalistic articles may not have done. So there is a way in which changing the form can have a huge impact, but at the same time, the facts remain true to reality. So the facts that were there in the fictional account remain true, but it's told in a different form. And I think that's one of the things that these new forms we have available to us today, whether it's television or podcasts, or, so, does, does allow us to play with, as long as we remain true to the facts. And that, as a historian, for me, is extremely important. Can you hear me? So talking about journalism being used as, a f as film, isn't that what you've done with uh, An Insignificant Man? It's journalism, but it's as a documentary. And uh, tell us a little bit about the film and the form. Uh, so how many of you have uh, managed to uh, see the film? It's um, An Insignificant Man. Okay. Okay, fewer than virtual reality audiences. Yeah, yeah. but uh, tell, explain yeah. a bit about so, K.H. Rival. Uh, go and see it. It's really, really important film. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sivil. Anand, explain yeah. about K.H. Yeah. Rival for the so, other panelists. Uh, yeah, surely. So, uh, Khushbu Ranka and Vinay Shukla the, uh, uh, have directed this really wonderful film. I've uh, had the privilege to, to produce it. Um, they, these two young filmmakers followed the emergence of an of a new political party. Uh, the, a, a group of activists, journalists, were, were a part of a very important anti-corruption movement uh, ha that happened in India a couple of years ago. It, um, it, it was the zeitgeist at the time. There was the Arab Spring happening in one part of the world. There was Syriza happening in another part of the world. Fordham was happening in another part of the world. There was Nevalny happening in Russia. So this is kind of the zeitgeist of the last few years in a way. And, uh, India saw its uh, anti-corruption movement, and from this movement emerged uh, a group of people who decided to enter mainstream politics by forming a political party. And uh, just around the time when they were making this announcement, two young filmmakers from our studio decided to just move lock, stock, and barrel to follow this story. And they they really they first intuitively and then just pen, just penetrated the spaces that that all of this co discourse was happening at so they found themselves in the middle of their um, their their campaign conversations at the beginning the strategies in the, in the beginning and increasingly they they became this fly on the wall camera while they were going through this entire journey of uh, of formulating a political party and and making it uh, and bringing it to the to the mainstream so they, uh, they started recording everything they were talking. Like literally every conversation was being recorded by the filmmakers. They, they were given this access by, by the political party uh, because one of their, one of their biggest uh, claims and one of the biggest promises they were making to the community was that they're going to practice complete transparency and they're going to bring in decentralized democracy. They're going to bring in right to recall. So they, they were a community driven political party so they had uh, it would have been impossible for them to not give access to to young journalists young transparency journalists. was their big transparency thing was a, was a was a big promise on on the table so they uh, so khushbu and vinay they followed their uh, started following their, their everything they were doing and then they started following them 
in their cars and in their houses and they started looking at their, their arguments, their disagreements, their, their fallouts. Um, literally everything that happened to the political party was documented on camera, pr probably for the first time in the history of um, politics or political cinema this happened, this, this entire thing uh, took place. And uh, from that it came 450 hours of footage through, mm -hmm. through, one, through the entire year of the party's evolution. And that party did come into power, it won the elections and came into power, it's presently in power in Delhi. And uh, Khushbu and Vinay passed down 450 hours of footage into a 95 minutes long documentary feature. It's called An Insignificant Man, it's been running in theatres. Uh, it's Right now we are having the fourth week in theatres, it's done incredibly well, it's been warmly received across the political spectrum. People have responded incredibly well to the film. It's travelled around the world, it's been co-produced by, uh, co-funded by Sundance, Busan, Itfa, Bertha, Doc. it's won several, several international awards, been to 50 international film festivals and, um, and has, has had a um, very interesting impact on, uh, and a very meaningful impact on, on, on the political discourse that's happening in the country right now. Um, so, what Khushbu and Vinay have managed to do that is really special cinematically is is that they haven't used any na any voiceovers. So mm. being a doc, so it's a documentary feature without any voiceovers or without any piece to cameras. So there is no narrativization. There is no retrospective narrativization that has been enabled. Uh, what happens with documentary features is one through voiceovers and through piece to cameras. Um, there is, there is always an opportunity for retrospective narrativization, which doesn't exist with this film at all because what you see is what you get. You're seeing exactly things as they unfolded. Um, and they were recorded on camera and they've just been lined up together for, for meaning to emerge. So that's, that's the film and... Uh, what kind of market do you have? How do you distribute this film? Is there a sort of a new method of getting it screened? Right, so, uh, so again we wanted to we wanted to insist that this is a community project in, at every level. So right from, the, right from funding to eventual release of the film was completely, completely driven with the community, which means uh, we started the film with a crowdfunding project. It became the most successful uh, crowdfunding uh, campaign for a, for a non-fiction film in India. Uh, we, we, raised, uh, we raised 12 times of what we set out to raise. Uh, and then when we, when we completed the film, we decided that we are not going to let the gatekeepers of cinema, the distributors and exhibitors, the classical distributors and exhibitors, who are always looking, hmm. looking at what worked in the past and hence not being able to speculate or predict what's going to work in the future, uh, and hence keeping the whole system in the past. And it's a chicken and egg problem because nobody is willing to break into that. So we, d we decided we're not going to let them decide. Uh, we're going to go straight to the audiences hmm. like we did for crowdfunding. We're going to st go straight to our audiences and ask our audiences to release the film, become the presenters and exhibitors and distributors of the film and get the film released in theatres. So we started a small campaign around it. We, uh, we created, uh, we used a tool that PBR Cinemas had called Wakao and we, using that tool we invited audiences across the country to, to replicate the crowdfunding model to distribution. So all they have to do is a month in advance book a theatre uh, close to them by just buying one ticket. And then they have to encourage friends and family and friends of friends and uh, friends of family to, uh, to buy the rest of the tickets, tickets to meet a certain threshold. If that threshold is meet, met within the next two weeks, two weeks before the release of the film, then the film gets released in that theater. If the threshold is not met, then they get their money back. Can I employ you? <laughs> Can I employ you? My, my poetry. <laughs> yes, please. Fantastic. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, but, but who... Who did the editing though? Because somebody obviously chose and selected. Of course, of course. No, no. We made the film. So, so, so somebody is crafting a narrative somewhere. Certainly, certainly there is narrative, and the the editing the editing is the voice. The voice of the author is present in the editing, but at the same time, given the fact that it's uh, it's cr uh, chronologically unfolding as it unfolded with live footage, with live cameras. Uh, there is there is very little na again retrospective narrativization even at the uh, disposal of the author. So while uh, and the editorial uh, aspiration there from Khushbu and Vinay was to only distill the truth, only uh, pass down the entire uh, material to to what actually happened, to keep 
to pull out moments that were representative of a wide variety of moments. So each moment in that sense has been retained uh, for its representation quality, for, for, the, for its ability to represent a wide variety of things that were happening. Thanks. Yeah. And Cathy, you go directly to the reader now, you said, with, digital, with the digital medium at your disposal. And you know, we used to think of cartoonists as being funny, and they are funny, but they're also at the front line today of politics, you know, after Charlie Hebdo. I mean, if you think of 10 journalists being killed on one, one day, they were all cartoonists. And uh, how has that sort of affected you all? Uh, I think that, um, well, we, um, I already took myself reasonably seriously as a political cartoonist, but that moment of, of Charlie Hebdo and, and hearing uh, the news that all these cartoonists and other journalists had been, had been shot in their office, it, was, it took my husband actually at the end of that day to, to look at me with a, with a slightly horrified face and say, but they were doing what you do. Yeah and think that that was something that was serious. So um, can we bring up an image that is uh, two on from the first one that, that you showed, about the third image? So I was actually on holidays when that, when that happened. Happened, okay. And, uh, and I was asked to respond um, by my newspaper because, and also by other media because it was right. known that I had connections with French cartoonists and I knew oh. one, of the, one of the fellows who was killed. And, you knew uh, and one of them. Yes, and, um, and so I, next one after that. Thank you. And so I was asked to draw something and I didn't have my best materials, but, um, but just to consider, yeah. as I thought, the, the, what, <laughs> what basically had always seemed like such an innocent thing to gravitate to drawing. It was a, you know, a happy place for a small child to think of drawing pictures of people, and that was basically a portrait of myself, aged three or whatever, and how I would have drawn a, a person. And, and with what then we knew after Charlie Hebdo to, to impose these, pa these parents looking on saying, I'm worried she might do something reckless, it just seemed so completely absurd to think of drawing as, as, a, as a dangerous thing. Um, but so it has, so it has proven, um, and that's because it's such a, an immediate medium. It's, yeah. it, you know, there, there is, um, there's a, a quick interpretation to be made because of the visuals. If there are words, then, then the message can be um, very unequivocal. It can be very direct. And in fact, it's been interesting for me to meet ca cartoonists who, who live in much less free countries than, than I do, where I have basically have complete, you know, all but complete editorial freedom. Um, to, live, to talk with people who live in much more um, strict regimes where they have to navigate around a bunch of ba um, boundaries and they work often on, on the ambiguity, the mm -hmm. basically sort of a deniable ambiguity so that what they're saying to their audience in their cartoons is not the same as the authorities are meant to see or that the authorities when they might question is that what you're saying, they can say no, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not what my drawing says, can't you see? It's something else entirely. So, so without the specifics of words, then they then they can they can navigate around those those limits. Um, it's it's interesting for me too to talk with other um, countries from uh, cartoonists from other countries too to find out the extent to which they sometimes do respect those boundaries that are imposed. You know, kind of in the way of a, of the the Stockholm. Um, syndrome. Syndrome. Mm -hmm. That they, you know, they sort of say, "Oh well, this is the, these are the rules we live under." And to a, you know, and I'm probably just as institutionalized, being in the same newspaper for 28 years or so, that I, I probably know just to feel where where the boundaries are that that come with working for a mainstream newspaper mm -hmm. rather than being just my own lone voice out you know, on Twitter or, or whatever. I am, I am still working for a newspaper and I'm still, to some degree, reflecting there. You know, I'm, I'm working for them they, and, and so I'm, I need to respect their, their purview of, of my work. Um, but uh, but what, what has been interesting for me to see, um, especially in putting my work out 
on social media as, as well is that you can you can have the accolades and you can have the uh, positive support, Praise. but also you can have the, the very negative blowback. Um, trolled? Do you get trolled a lot? Well, you know, not not by many standards a lot, and uh, and I'm and I'm sometimes surprised at how how tidy a house I keep in my in my Twitter feed that right. that that I don't get too many horrible and uninvited visitors there. But I also find that to watch that proceeding going on when other people are having their arguments and so on can be also really instructive. Um, if you'd like to move on to one, two, three, four, five more cartoons, can you just flick through about five and I'll tell you when? And there's one that's called Your Week on Twitter. Huh. You can take your time on these if you like. <laughs> oh yes, there's for storytelling too. So instead of binding it, or binding, binding it all in a book, maybe we can just send out a paragraph now and then. That would be, <laughs> um, for another way of yes. storytelling. So another one after that. There we go. Your week on Twitter. So this was also very shortly after Charlie Hebdo, and I was still figuring out, you know, wh what to make of it because I was hearing the polemical discussion going on where some people started to say, well, the sorts of cartoons they published in Charlie Hebdo, they were very, they were very anti-Semitic or they were racist or they were this or that and it was, they shouldn't have said this. And so people sort of started to equivocate about what was, about whether in fact these cartoonists were in some way deserving, deserving mm -hmm. of, of the response, um, which to my mind was, was just terrible, <laughs> inadmissible. Mm -hmm. um, so, so here is how I saw the, the arguments as being polarized. So here is, here is Twitter troll approaching cartoonist at desk saying, so, do you believe in free speech? Well, do you? Yes, but, so, you believe people should be free to incite racial hatred, do you? No, but, ha, so you think it was wrong of Charlie Hebdo to publish those cartoons? No, but, aha, so you believe that it's okay to provoke extremists? No, but, ha, what are you, a coward? So at all moments on, on uh, because of the immediacy of the, of the social media, at all moments people are, are somehow feel compelled to take a stand, to take a position that is, that is you know, black and white mm -hmm. on a thing, or, you know, are you on this side, are you on that side, are you, you know, which, which team are you, are you on? And, and my sort of challenge as this hapless little person at, at the desk there, um, so, so drawn, is, is to, to find some way between all of those ways, you know, to say that there's actually room for nuance in this argument, and there are there are many sides to to um, to a, an issue. Um, so that's uh, so that that becomes my my job on the front line is is to sometimes there's an, a really obvious way to put something, um, but it doesn't always admit the, the the complexities of an issue, and I want to try and find a way to to, to bring the complexities of an issue out in my cartoon without... To navigate that. To, yeah, yeah, to navigate those nuances. Uh, talking about Twitter, Sunil, do you think uh, Gandhi would have been on Twitter? <laughs> he was a big <laughs> well, mass media. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, he I mean, he was, certainly, he, he was certainly a master of the you know, technologies of the mass media right early on. Yes, uh, yes. talk uh, about the, that. The, 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 the microphone, he, he very studiedly always had a very soft voice when he spoke, oh. but he also made sure that when microphones were available, the microphone would broadcast the voice, so people would always be leaning forward to hear what, what he would have to say. Right. But, but, you know, also, I think the way he used uh, the photographic and visual image, was, was, he was a master of that. I mean, you know, to give you an example I, that I write about in, in Incarnations, in my essay on Gandhi, um, you know, when he goes on the salt march uh, in, in 1930, he, he, he choreographs the whole march. He makes sure that only he, he uh, looks like the leader, only he's allowed to carry a stick all his followers, he handpicks. Uh, there's no political uh, badges, or they, they wear this timeless white clothes so that they look like kind of you, you know they, they they can't be placed in a particular moment. Um, and of course, he invites camera crews and photographers to follow him, um, and and he chooses who they are from the international uh, journalistic uh, uh, core. Um, and, you know, he, when he's being filmed, he knows when he's being filmed, and he makes it a point to walk faster 
So he looks like he's walking faster on film than he actually did in reality. Oh, Gandhiji did yes, all this. Absolutely. So, and the point of that is not to kind of say that he was a charlatan or a fraud or whatever. He, he was a very strategic thinker. Uh, and, and, and actually, it's remarkable to see how well he was able to yes. use this technology. Yeah. So I think it actually, to, to, to pick up on those details about him, to see him as a human being thinking strategically, is actually to see his greatness. Uh, whereas I think, unfortunately, what we tend to do is we obscure those human details. We turn figures like Gandhiji and many others into a kind of mythic figure. He's made superhuman, so the fact that he then does superhuman things should be unsurprising to us. Whereas if you actually see him as a human being, the fact that he does such extraordinary things, that's what makes him really surprising. Okay. Uh, so, you know, what I was trying to do in, in those 50 essays is to make each of those figures human, mm -hmm. to show how they could think tactically, how they could be shrewd, how they could be cunning, and how they used technology or whatever was available to them, verse, uh, uh, you know, verse forms to express and communicate their views because they each had something to say. I think that's the crucial thing. The, yeah, the, the, I, I, I always, uh, and this is a great way of putting it, that Gandhi would have been on Twitter and yeah. I always feel that Buddha would have been a filmmaker, you know. <laughs> what? And, what? I, I mean, a film, again, the, the idea of, of or, or a virtual reality maker, if, yeah. uh, if he had been around right now, or, uh, you know, the, the apocryphal uh, Buddha at least. Uh, so. I, I think that uh, any, anybody who has made it their life's mission to consolidate, assimilate a wide variety of truths, to become comp to be systems thinkers, to be complexity thinkers, to be uh, policy thinkers, using the breakthroughs of human wisdom, the, uh, using, assimilating the greatest ideas and the greatest breakthroughs of all human wisdom and finding new recipes as solutions mm -hmm. and then transmitting these solutions to a wide variety of people, mm -hmm. uh, they are always going to use the latest technology, technology with the greatest amount of uh, ability to, to find, uh, to spread to new audiences, to transmit to new audiences, to transmit to a, a massive number of people mm -hmm. uh, with the greatest amount of emotional fidelity. So, and film allows you to do that. Uh, Kabir, on the other hand, m perhaps might have still been a poet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but but can, can, can I, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, I mean, one way in which Gandhi, you know, was a precursor was in the way in which he used letters and responded to letters. So he was a, always, res in a sense, it was like a Twitter feed. He was feed. a very good correspondent, yes. he replied. Yeah. But the crucial thing was that it was always very civil. Oh. So even when he disagreed or people disagreed with him, it was conducted in a kind of rational, logical, civil form. So he, he wasn't, um, it, it didn't become kind of, you know, just shouting back well, and forth. That's what Twitter and, is, unfortunately. And, 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 we, and we forget that letters are technology. We, yeah. we, we yeah, letters are. are indeed technology and uh, so, so are, I mean, just as much as radio is, yeah. but, and so is language itself. Language is, it's technology. is a constantly evolving technology that is, of course, there is a biological embed to that, but there is, language is also technology. Highly developed form of technology, yeah. yes, yeah. Cathy. Just going to ask if we could move on two more cartoons from the last one we showed to show the, the extreme danger <laughs> of this particular technology too and what it's being now used for. The next one after Twitter. that. There we go. So how does this new defense system work? It strategically intercepts and destroys the president's tweets before <laughs> they're able to leave our airspace. I wonder which president you're talking about. I don't know. <laughs> Right. That's, yes. that's where, it's that, a good if day. anyone needs a demonstration of the, the potential danger of, of, uh, of Twitter. Yes. <laughs> Robert, does the BBC rely on Twitter a lot? Or, I mean, BBC is using, you said, all kinds of new things, YouTube, music. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, think that the challenge for the BBC now, particularly in India, but through the UK, is basically to keep our core audience, our sort of dedicated audiences, which has been with us for years, decades, and to maintain the youth audience, which is fickle, uh, dispersed, diverse, um, and they, don't, they no longer adhere to classical, traditional, mainstream broadcasting. Mm -hmm. So if you take, for example, radio as an example, mm -hmm. uh, radio is perceived, radio, everyone thought radio would die, so television comes in, 1930s, 1950s, that's the end of radio. This illusion, this myth, you can only have one medium, has mm -hmm. been completely 
blown out of the yeah. water. So the realization now that each media, each medium does a different thing. It has a different gift, it has a different disposition, different perspective. Um, so radio has been a big success story, but now it's youth are abandoning radio oh. until fanfare, the podcast, podcast. which is really, yeah. in many ways, it is radio. But as Sunil said, what it does allow you to do is it allows a far more intimate expression, an intimate dialogue, which ironically, if you go right back to the dawn of radio in 1922, you have pictures of men and women, mainly men, it must be said, with headphones on. So the initial experience of radio in the 20s mm -hmm. was a personal expression, a personal interpretation. But now, what podcasts do, they do, they do give you that intimacy, but also, as distinct from mainstream broadcasting, they do allow um, diverse voices, they allow um, sacrilegious humor, they allow intimacy of discourse and revelation. So they are doing slightly different things, but really, broadly, it's radio renominated for a different digital age for youth. We just co-produced uh, a VR, a virtual reality documentary with BBC. That's also on, showing here. On what? Which one? Uh, it's, uh, it's called um, Across the Clouds. Or oh, yes, yes. The, the, right. the, the girls who go to school yes, yes. in Himalayas. So we, so we did that with uh, the BBC. And yeah. it's, it's showing here at the v VR. And that's movie. a perfect example of bringing an experience to life immersively uh, that would have been in documentary or news yeah. terms actually quite anodyne, exactly. but you, you absolutely take on these fantastic journeys these kids get to, is, to go to school. Going on the journey yeah. What's the, the story about? The story is about two, uh, two young girls going to school and, and making a lot of effort using the tram. It's, it's actually almost precarious the way they, yeah. they, they route to, to school. And um, the, the experience that, we, that we've uh, co-produced with the BBC allows you to be immersed with their journey. So you are on the on the on. ropeway while they are going to school. You're along you're walking with them as you're as they're walking their way making their way to the school. Oh okay. So it's a completely nice. immersive experience. So it's, yeah. it's sort of the wire really again, isn't it? It's yeah. it's about memorability. You take that away as an emotionally invested experience of in a way course. you could never have done if it was just a fact in a newspaper. Okay, we are out of time but I wanted Robert to read one poem at least, Robert and Give the little, if there's any history or context, please, and then we'll take questions from the audience. But this is my crowdsourcing moment. Yes, one, que one poem and, and, we and want. Ju ju just from to set the poet. context, because it, it really, it's, it's Sunil's point again. <laughs> this poems come from everywhere. And this one, I was reading an article about people who marry very young. And there was a quote from a 17 year old boy who said, Looking back, it was like being underwater. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he described his, his memory of this young engagement and consequent marriage, which of course was a failure. And I've never been married, but I thought that was just an extraordinary image. So I took that image, and this is really what poetry does. It takes an image and it travels through that image and creates a whole world. So this is first marriage. And the quote, the opening line is practically the newspaper quote. Looking back, it seemed to happen underwater. The shoes were smaller, the hands quite white. The voices came back in bubbles like raspberries. I do, I do. Did I? Did we somewhere make those lists? Pick a tie to match your bouquet, O'Donnell, not jade, we go through every shade of green. Smile for a mantelpiece across swimming rooms. Buy curtain rings and tin openers. Make love in front of a silent TV. Our bodies striped in watery light. And realize at night that the breathing goes on forever. Each exhalation like a wave. Water on our chests in a gray and green column as far as we could see. So we swam to the surface, clambered onto the mantelpiece, then watched the furniture float slowly away. Very nice, thanks very much. And now we'll open the floor to questions. Just stand up, ask, uh, identify the panelist to whom you're directing your question and go ahead. I think there are mics. Uh, 
Is there a mic? Uh, only five minutes? OK. <laughs> Sorry, I'll pass mine on to you. Yes. Hi. I have two questions, very small ones. One question, please. It's only five minutes. OK. Uh, so Sunil, I just want to ask you about the timelessness of stories and how uh, the new digital medium has impacted that. Are we going to create new myths which are, which are going to last? Which is the last great myth which was created? Uh, well, I think the, the, I think one of the problems of the availability, the easy availability of digital media, which can translate to transmit stories, is that actually that crucial element that's called fact checking doesn't happen very often with digital uh, diffusion of stories. So the process by which a newspaper is produced, or the process by which a historian writes, or a historical novelist writes, where they check the facts. Unfortunately, with the digital uh, media, you get stories that are immediately broadcast, uh, which actually can be quite factually inaccurate. And it's very, very hard, unfortunately, to, un to, to then correct incorrect stories. Stories have a way of just clinging on to uh, uh, the, the, the world, really, and clinging in, in our minds. And, and once something gets told, it's very hard to untell it so I think, in a sense, the easy availability of diffusing our ideas and stories requires, as a counterpart, a responsibility in how we use that, uh, and, and, and you know, to, to, to be accurate to the facts. Because one of the things we also realized with these new media is that stories can have a real impact in the world. People come to believe these stories and act on them, often in quite, quite dangerous and threatening ways. So I think that aspect of, of, of how we, we, we check the truthfulness of stories becomes very, very important. Uh, and, and, and I hope that we can keep that in mind. And indeed, I hope that some of our leaders, presidents, prime ministers, and others uh, could be a bit more responsible about how they diffuse their stories. Thank you, Sunil. Do we have time for more? We can take one more. One more? Yeah. Anybody? Okay, at the back there. Uh, yes, you. Right. So I had a question for Anam, where, um, you know, I'm thinking that VR being the future, will cinema really transcend, like, you've done a documentary. Will feature films then proceed to VR? And if feature films do proceed to VR and it becomes an immersive experience, I'm thinking, because we come from different worldviews, um, will people actually miss the point? Because everybody, as immersive as it gets, everybody is interpreting it differently. Will people really miss the point? Or will it, according to you, just as an opinion, do you think that uh, it will make people think deeper and uh, probably make something out of it? Because it is a more immersive experience. So. Uh, Will cinema transit to uh, VR? To me, is a question like, will architecture transit to music? Uh, they're, they're two completely different media. They'll have their own, they're two completely methods of expressing, transmitting knowledge, insights, and experiences. Um, theater did not have to, or performing arts did not have to transit to cinema the way uh, literature did not have to be replaced by cinema. Uh, we, like, uh, Robert mentioned, we, we use all our expressions. The moment we invent a tool, we, we do not give it up very easily because we, we know that it will allow us to have a very specific kind of experience, a very specific kind of transmission of knowledge and insights and, and perspective that may not be possible with other media. Poetry, for example, poetry, uh, again, I, I really believe in that expansive notion of poetry that it is, it is really everything Metaphor is the is the cornerstone is the cornerstone of human cognition. We uh, when when he when he mentioned uh, a watery light or when he mentioned water on on chest, 
um, while we may have it, while it may have invoked the image of really light uh, being right, light being refracted through water, at the same time it would have invoked a wide variety of emotional experiences and memories in in, in people that have to some extent um, a continuity. It's not as discontinuous as we'd imagine. As it's not as open as we'd like to imagine. Uh, so when Shakespeare says uh, Juliet is a son. Uh, he assumes and he knows that uh, no, not many people in the audience are likely to think that Juliet is a fiery ball of nuclear fission. Uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a very clear assumption of the codification that has happened within the, within the culture, within the community, that it's safe for, for the author to, to, to rely on the audience to understand that Juliet is a son could only mean that Juliet is radiant or life-giving or, 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 you know, full of, uh, full of uh, sunshine, which is another metaphor. So, uh, but the, the idea that we'd be using technology to, uh, to not create experiences or, to, or technology by itself uh, is, is to some extent possible, of course, because with an increasing ability to replicate reality, we do have lesser burden on on one hand on re, on that aspect of of a medium so while language has has the multiple burdens of also replicating reality and transcending it replicating reality and providing perspective cinema on the other hand uh, reduces that burden by replicating reality or replicating inner realities or dreams to a certain degree of fidelity and and transcending it Virtual reality, again, uh, is going to have to learn to create methods of, of creating perspectives and emotional experiences that transcend the fidelity of, uh, of, real, uh, of replication. So what I mean to say that by that is, uh, how many of you have seen bullet time in cinema? Like, you know what bullet time is? Okay. Only one geek in the audience? Uh, okay. So uh, bull bullet time is basically when in cinema, everything slows down and you know neo hangs in the air and the camera goes all around or like when when time slows down to be able to see the bullet going through air right that's that's how slow uh, that's the amount that's the kind of slow motion that we we see in cinema now anybody remembers i mean it's clearly an audience that doesn't know bullet time so i don't know if this question makes sense but <laughs> does anybody remember when bullet time was first used in cinema yes so you ask anybody who talks about slow motion and technology, the technological aspect of bullet time, and you would ask them, when was it first used by cinema? And they'd say the Matrix, but the answer is wrong. It was actually used a year before by a film called Blade that nobody remembers because it was a terrible film. So the point is, if you use technology, if you use tools to transmit experiences, insights, or knowledge, or, or wisdom that is not relevant to the community, only academics and geeks will remember the, the name of the story. You know, So it's going to... <laughs> So it's extremely relevant, the kind of experiences we're going to use and we're going to transmit. It's extremely important how we're going to constantly translate our fact to fiction or translate our fact to myths. How are we going to distill or parse down a wide variety of facts to larger narratives, larger myths, so that they can be consumed more easily. And these tools are only going to be capable of replicating reality to a higher degree of fidelity, not actually uh, take the burden of transmitting true wisdom and insight. I don't know if somewhere I answered your question. Okay, then we can have the okay. conversation outside. <laughs> sure. Okay, we can have one final question. We are already out of time, but we can have a little leverage here. One final question. Yeah, uh, so this question is to the panelists. Uh, Any one of you can answer. So now that I'm reading a lot of graphic novels and uh, because we are doing a lot of uh, poetry uh, in our classes, uh, I noticed that, you know, in books like The Watchmen written by Alan Moore, he, even though he uses uh, fictional characters, there are, uh, you know, elements of uh, uh, non-fiction in it. So do you think that each work, uh, regard, uh, you know, let it be fiction or non-fiction, has an element of, uh, you know, something that contrasts it just to make the reader more interested uh, in that particular work? So your question is, non-fiction, does it use elements from fiction? Yeah. Yes. Do you want to? Yeah, well, it's definitely in, in the retelling of, 
any story, and it's, it's in the same way that when we hear or read a story, we, we project onto it our own experience. And so in the retelling, there's always an interpretation, and that's why no single telling of a story, however factual, is going to be the same as every next person's telling of a story, in my view. Do you want to respond, Robert? Tell a lie, there's a saying, tell a lie to tell a truth. So actually, it is about deciding what you want to say and the best way of doing it. And it's not just about fidelity to the facts, it's about how you want to communicate and how your audience will resonate. So I think it's a much more complex, ambiguous context. Uh, I, uh, okay. I, I so wouldn't want this discussion to end with, on the line, it's not just about fidelity to the facts. I mean, I think as a historian and as one who's engaged and worried about politics today, I think it is about fidelity to the facts. I think that in whether it's storytelling in nonfiction or fiction, of course we always make choices. There's always editing, there's always a plot. Plots are edit, edited versions of reality, and of course that's the case. But I think fidelity to the facts is actually something that is really critical, and it's critical to the health of any democracy. And if we start playing with that in our public discussions, then we're in deep trouble. And no story is worth, uh, act no story about the real world is worth it if it's not true to the facts. You're quite right. I should have said fidelity to the truth. Yeah, that's, so then yeah. each person's truth is different. With the, uh, with the yeah. caveat. No. <laughs> there are, Sorry, each person's truth is not different. I agree. Each there, there is truth. There are objective truths. There, there are objective facts truth. which are undeniable a, and inalienable. Our, and our function as storytellers is to do the best to approximate that truth and to use whatever tools we have. With the ironic no. thing that what I get to do is I don't have the same requirement as, as a journalist mm -hmm. to report all the facts as as sort of numerically correct or, or you know perfectly correct i get full freedom to exaggerate the hell out of something mm -hmm. thereby pointing to a to truth. truth so yeah. so it, it's not simple <laughs> thank you thank you, thank you thank very you so much, much everyone um, well on that note ladies and gentlemen we're really very sorry we can't take any other questions but if you wish to take some questions we could do that offline off the stage there's another session coming in but if if time allows, I think there's a gentleman there who's been waiting for one. I think uh, our next session starts in uh, 15 minutes, so we could give you one question, one, one final question, yeah. No, it's on. Check, check, check. Check, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to add to what Sunil said and what the gentleman had asked Sunil earlier, that uh, the what are the greatest myths of the time today? I, I think the greatest uh, stories of the time today are facts. Because we have matured as a civilization. Uh, sure, sure, I, I got. I, okay, so, sure, okay, we'll talk about it. We can't hear you. Hello. Uh, quickly, please. Can you hear me? Yes. I want to share my experience in telling the story. Uh, I'm a scientist. I wrote a technical paper of an invention, and I was presenting in a very big seminar. In, the, in, the, in my paper, in my research paper, I wrote a story of Hanumanji, how he got the Siddhis. So after the, uh, all the presentation of this thing, of technical paper and the invention, nobody remembered about the invention, but 90% of the people remembered the story of Anumanji. So What's the impact question? of the story is very important in the whole thing. Thank you. In fact, uh, in fact <laughs> that's, uh, you know, I, I was, what the point I was going to make was exactly the opposite of that. That's very interesting that you mentioned that because uh, the point I was going to make is that we do not necessarily need myths anymore because we have, as a civilization, advanced to a point where we can consume fact, where we can uh, consume truth and uh, truth of a greater fidelity towards fact. Uh, we don't, a myth was a parsing down a distillation of fact and truth for an audience that did not have enough 
codified systems, enough education, enough insights, enough literacy, enough ability to pass down fact logically. That's when you need more myths. We, are, we have arrived at a time when facts can be presented very beautifully, like Sunil does, like a lot of great non-fiction authors around the world are doing. Facts can be passed down, built together, put together. In, and and I, I'm a science communi communicator. Uh, I'm, a re I'm, I'm researching on integrated systems biology. And today, when I, when I tell stories, I tell scientific stories. I tell stories of proof. I do not need, I do not find myself in a need for falling back on myths of any, of any nature. Um, I can tell a few stories outside because now we have run out of time. I wish I had more time to tell one of those stories that I tell very often. It's a story about, a, um, about this fungus called Cordyceps unilateralis, how it hijacks an ant and makes an ant behave in a certain way and changes the behavior of an ant. It's a fantastic story and we don't need uh, to fall back on Aesop's fables anymore because we have more integrated, more accurate, more uh, and understanding of life around us and we have better abilities as audiences to receive these truths around us. Thank you.